you've often referred to yourself as a speculative architect and I'm wondering could you maybe begin by explaining what you feel a speculative architect is and maybe giving us an introduction into you and to your, your background. Sure, so my name is Liam Young and as you mentioned I call myself a speculative architect and I think for me that really means that I still operate as an architect does but I don't design or make physical buildings rather I tell stories about the ways that technology technology is changing and shaping space. So I work within the mediums of film, fiction and performance to prototype uh, imaginary worlds, to tell stories about how our cities, our buildings and the spaces in which we all operate are radically changing in the context of new technologies or global climate change, for example. And I think the, uh, the research and the reading then from what I've always known of your work, I've always felt that there was always this underlying principle that architecture goes far beyond the, just the design of a medium-sized building, that in fact, a study of architecture allows you to engage with global flows, be they global flows of food or energy, or take your work with the Unknown Fields um, uh, studio that you run uh, where you would go to the outback in Australia to study raw materials and mining. Uh, and then also you're working in uh, virtual space, uh, examining these global flows of technology and of commerce and of, uh, of digital information. So do you think this connection between architecture and, and global flows and how global flows inform architecture, is that a fair reading of your work or is there a different way that you kind of see it? Yeah, I, I've always said that architects' skills are in many ways wasted on just making buildings. Um, because what we're able to do is synthesize complex information. We, we operate between technology and culture, so we're able to explore the cultural implications of new technologies uh, in ways that a lot of disciplines in being siloed can't. You know, an, an architect can can sit in a bar and have an interesting conversation with an engineer or a builder, as well as a film director or an anthropologist or a geographer. Um, it's one of the last disciplines um, that, that really, when you're studying it, al allows you to, to read a book on philosophy or um, the history of art, uh, as well as um, learn coding. Um, uh, and operating various complex software systems. And, you know, we've tried to do the best as a discipline to, to dissolve those skills and, and a lot of architecture programs are disappearing into vocational training to try and prepare someone for life in an office. Um, but uh, at the core of the discipline, we're able to explore the way that people operate in space. And... At the moment, the, the forces that shape and define our cities and our spatial experiences don't exist on single sites anymore. Um, you know, an architect that's trying to you know, engage in the site of their project no longer can ju just look at the flows and circulation in and around it or the sun path diagram of a particular geographic location. They need to start to understand their site within a complex network condition that includes global material flows, that includes um, the, the informational systems um, that that site and in turn that building might be caught up in, uh, that includes um, data flows and um, uh, large scale networks. Mm -hmm. So really for an architect, even just to do what we traditionally are supposed to do even, um, somehow we need to be exploring what it is to intervene in the planetary scale megastructure that it is our modern world. So it means that we need to start to talk differently. It means to start, we need to start to think differently. We need to start to conceive of the idea of sight differently. Um, and that's really what Unknown Fields is about. Um, it's a nomadic research studio that I run with Kate Davies, who's a, an architect based in London. And that project is, is really concerned with trying to redefine sight. For, for us as designers. Um, so what we do is, is we travel behind the scenes of the modern city and we go to the resource landscapes that 
produce the city. And in turn, we go to the waste landscapes that that city produces. Um, because we're trying to make this argument that in order to understand place, in order to understand a city like London or Shenzhen or Los Angeles, where I'm speaking to you from now, you need to look at all of the multiple sites scattered around the world that are implicated in the production of these cities. Um, and Unknown Fields gets on a plane and travels to them and makes work, films, provocative objects that try and tell those stories of connection. Um, and then my own practice here in LA as a, as, a, as a filmmaker and a fiction writer is to um, speculate then on the future implications of, of these conditions and to imagine where these kind of weak signals um, might suggest we're going. One of the, uh, you're, you're known for, for telling the story and for delivering this message uh, through these very vivid films. And I'm wondering where, where, the, where your interest and your passion in film began. Did this precede any interest in, in the built environment or uh, did, did one follow the other? Or what, what was your, what was your where, where did your intersection between film and, and, uh, and architecture originate? Yeah, I mean, if fiction and film is an extraordinary shared language. I think all of us, um, you know, before we can read, before we can sit up on our own, we're, we're, we're dropped down in front of the TV, um, we consume film. Uh, and it, in many ways, it's one of the mediums through which we engage the world or we understand the world. Um, so I think all of us have always been fans of film in some way. Um, and I started to become interested in it as a, as a designer because I saw the opportunities in film as a medium within which we can embed critical architectural and urban ideas. My great frustration with, with working within the discipline of architecture has often been the, the incredibly niche audience that most of us talk to. Um, you know, we're, as Kibnis famously said, you know, we're extraordinarily famous to a very small amount of people. We, um, tour the world giving lectures to, to tiny rooms full of other architects. Um, uh, we publish books that have print runs of maybe 1500 at best um, uh, that we sell to other architects. Um, uh, we do exhibitions that other architects go to. Um, we're really bad as a discipline um, at uh, talking to wider audiences sending our ideas out in a form that's digestible, accessible, in many ways accessible, is always a label, a derogatory term that we give architecture um, when we're trying to dismiss it as being unintelligent and unsophisticated. Um, but really, if we value the work and ideas that we do and talk about, we need to be better at trying to find mediums through which we can get those ideas out into the world in meaningful ways. So film for me was a way to connect to broader audiences and to, to try and get more of those audiences talking about architectural and urban ideas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's really what I'm doing here in LA is, is trying to co-opt the Hollywood machine and and use the mediums of popular culture like a Trojan horse to cite within them critical ideas about what our future cities might look like um, or who we might be um, in the context of, of new technologies, hoping that you know, we can start to engage people in these conversations rather than just making you know, tiny small print run books about them and, and giving them to our friends. So that's essentially why I'm, I'm here in LA, essentially why uh, I make film. Um, I remember late last year in Shenzhen, you presented a film, um, The Soul City Machine. Uh, the way you presented it was excellent. You gave a, a very rich narrative uh, over it as it kind of played in the background. The uh, central idea behind that film, which if people are watching this on Arc Daily, you, if you scroll down, you'll see the, the trailer for this video, for the, for the film. Uh, this kind of, you can probably describe it much better, but this kind of almost dystopian future for the, the South Korean capital, with, where uh, 
autonomous robots and drones and AI become the almost the dominant citizens. And it's narrated by this chat uh, AI bot, um, very rem reminiscent of Siri or Cortana, which is um, kind of guiding uh, guiding the citizen through through future soul. I wonder, could you maybe reflect or unpack what you were trying to uh, communicate or what message you were trying to bring through that video? Sure. So a lot of our work right now is, is concerned with how automation is changing the nature of cities. So Soul City Machine is an exploration of um, what that might look like um, using Seoul as a context, uh, you know, South Korea is a is a context um, with an extraordinary adoption rate for new technologies. Um, so it seemed like the, the perfect setting to start to explore these ideas. And what really we're trying to explore here is, is the idea that we now share our cities with um, a whole array of non-human inhabitants that, is just, that are just as critical, if not more critical, occupants of our cities um, than we are. Uh, I mean, I published a book, um, uh, an edition of Architectural Design last year called Machine Landscapes, that's a similar exploration of the same kind of topic. Like that the, the most significant uh, spaces in our modern time are actually spaces designed not for people at all, but for machines. Data centers, uh, the cultural topography of our time, star architects you know, were once concerned with uh, the making of factories, then housing, um, then the Dream Commission was the, the, the big cultural institution like the museum or the gallery. Now the star architects of our age, although perhaps they wouldn't admit it, are actually the, the data center architects because this is our, our generation's cultural repository when, um, uh, when everything becomes digital. So I was interested with that film to, to show a city that's not just um, a portrait of a place inhabited by a, a bunch of people, but a portrait of a place that's now a shared territory with humans and machines coexisting in really interesting and meaningful ways. Um, so here we're presenting a portrait of a, of a place where um, an operating system um, is essentially the, the, the form of governance of that city. Um, we no longer publicly elect um, uh, a, a politician, um, but we, um, uh, we run a, 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 an operating system. Um, and the, the voiceover um, of the film is uh, a chatbot that we designed and trained on um, uh, urban protocols. Um, and the film, the format of the film is really a love letter between that operating system and its citizens. And we're trying to think about, like, if, if a city is managed by an AI, as actually so many of our cities already are, what is that form of interaction? Um, how are we citizens of that city and not just customers? How might we engage with it? How might we have a conversation with it? Um, uh, how might that interaction be meaningful? How might we still have agency in that context. Um, the film's trying to touch on, uh, in a you know, in a subtle and poetic way, um, a lot of those ideas, and and trying to force us to think about who we are in this context, and and what are the systems that we're beginning to enter, uh, we're beginning beginning to allow into our lives. Um, you know, and it's it's trying to engage with this present moment where. You know, people are now confessing suicidal thoughts to Amazon Alexa. Um, you know, what is the nature of these interactions between ourselves and, and, and these bots? And that's really what we're just trying to touch on with, with this work. And the uh, accompanying that video, you wrote a very good piece of text which spells out that question very well because that whole Biennale was around this idea of... Uh, if the city can speak back to us and if we can, if the city can see us, what is the nature of that interaction? And you set up this, um, this uh, not so much a choice, but a, a division between the Siri and the Cortana of today, which is again, this legacy of human to human interaction where there's a voice, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the suggestion of even a gender and a personality, or will, uh, as, uh, 
as cities gain the ability to communicate back to us, uh, will we need to create a whole new form of communication that we don't know of yet? And I wonder, have you had um, further thoughts since on, uh, and maybe from even what you saw in the rest of the Biennale, who will it be that, that makes that choice? Who will design that choice? Do you think it will be architects? Do you think it will be programmers? Will it be politicians? Uh, who uh, Have you had many thoughts on how the future of that, uh, um, that interaction might play out? Yeah, it's, it's part of writing that piece and, and uh, writing a piece for the, the Machine Landscapes book that I mentioned. Um, I was able to interview uh, Deborah Harrison, who uh, was the chief personality architect of Microsoft Cortana. Um, I also inter in, in interviewed the, the programmer of Hotsini Miku um, and um, uh, Professor Ishiguru, who, who um, is the extraordinary scientist that's been... Um, building these androids um, uh, that look like himself uh, and his, and his um, various um, uh, dream companions. Um, talking about this very question, you know, what, what, when our environment starts talking back to us, um, what is that relationship that we might have? You know, for a long time, our, our, our buildings have, have stood silent. Um, uh, now we're having conversations with them. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, these, these early chatbots like, like Siri and Cortana, um, uh, the, the DNA of how we will interact with machines and spaces and objects in the future is already encoded into, into these relationships, which is why I thought it was really important to make a film like Soul, Mach Soul City Machine that um, it's exploring an engagement with chatbots. It's why I thought it was important to interview these people because the way that we interface with these just benign, dumb bots actually is setting in motion um, forms of interaction that will come. Um, and it's really interesting the way that Cortana is actually designed. It's, it's, it's less a room full of programmers writing lines of code and, and the way that Deborah Harrison describes it, it's more like a writer's room for a sitcom where they source um, a, huge, a huge amount of queries that are gathered from people interacting with Cortana on a day-to-day -day basis, and then they make a selection of those queries and they write responses. They, they code Cortana's behavior, you know, and, and you, they, you get into really interesting questions like what kind of accent should Cortana have? Is Cortana gendered? Is Cortana um, uh, from a particular cultural background? Um, What's Cortana's political leanings? Does Cortana um, subscribe to the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, does Cortana vote for Donald Trump? Um, does Cortana believe in, in, in um, uh, the Second Amendment and access to firearms? Um, what does Cortana say when you ask um, uh, if, it's, if, if, if it's a girl? Is it a he or a she? Um, you know, and, and, and for the most part, um, uh, Deborah's team wrote Cortana to be entirely gender neutral. Um, but if you think about a simple question, like, um, like when they were trying to think of the response to, um, hey, Cortana, are you a girl? Are you a woman? Um, uh, the response is really loaded. Like if Cortana says, no, I'm not a, I'm not a girl, that kind of denial suggests that perhaps that's, that's some kind of negative. You know, like, like, no, don't, of course I'm not a girl. Don't think of me as being a girl. Um, uh, so the response they came up with is, no, um, uh, I'm not a girl, but I'm awesome like a girl. Um, uh, so um, they always have to tread so carefully and lightly. Um, and, you know, those kind of responses are actually really meaningful. I guess that's the argument I'm trying to make is that, um, the fact that all of these um, chatbots have been gendered in a particular way um, conditions us to how we think that how we think of these machines. Um, and going forward, when they become more complex and more ingrained in our everyday life, not just things we talk to and we want to change our Spotify play to playlist, um, you know, I think a lot of these choices are going to have consequence. So I guess I'm arguing that that at the moment we're pushing. Um, our interface with these things through um, the narrow window of, of what we think of as human to human interaction. And I guess what I'm arguing for is how we might think of a fundamentally different way 
of, of talking or engaging with these things? Is it um, a form of sign language? Is it clicking buttons on a mouse? Is it having a conversation? What does it mean to have a conversation with a massive Amazon warehouse? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have a conversation with um, an autonomous shipping crane loading containers at Shenzhen port? I don't know, but I, I think we need to start to explore what that means in, in, um, in, in, in a much more unexpected ways than what we're doing at the moment. Um, uh, Hatsune Miku is a great example. Hatsune Miku is the world's first kind of animated pop star um, developed by um, Krypton Media, which um, really a company that was creating a voice simulation software system. Um, and in order to market their, their vocoder to the world, they created Hatsune Miku as an animated pop star that would show off the extraordinary capabilities of their voice synthesizer. Um, and they were referencing a classic uh, Casio keyboard that was black, white, and um, kind of turquoise. And that's why Hatsune Miku has turquoise hair. That's why she wears a black and white outfit. Was they were trying to turn that Casio keyboard into a humanoid-like form that we could cheer for and, and scream about at a Hatsune Miku concert. But I start to ask them, you know, why this sexualized um, anime creature um, with a sultry form and, and long turquoise ponytails, why couldn't we start to develop a meaningful relationship with the Casio keyboard as an object? Um, why does it need to be humanized? And I think that's something that we can start to explore as designers. Like, what does it mean to actually develop meaningful relationships with a geometric black object like uh, Amazon Alexa sitting on our desk or um, kind of a fabric coated blob like Google Home. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've been looking a lot at um, uh, um, notions of objectification um, and objectophilia. Um, it's, if you can do a deep dive on the internet and go into really strange places where you look at people that have kind of married the Eiffel Tower or married a, a, a balustrade on their staircase, like, or have a sexual relationship with the doorknob. Um, uh, like there's this whole genre of sexual fetish um, where you develop really strange and intimate attachments to objects. Like, is that a piece of psychology we need to be engaging with in order to think about how clients might operate within their houses um, in the future? I don't know. At the moment, we're just, uh, they're just wild speculations and, and strange Google searches. But um, I guess I'm arguing for this to be a really critical line of investigation for us as architects. Uh, it raises a lot of possibilities, actually, for uh, the future of the design process, because it was really interesting listening to you talk about the rigor by which Cortana is designed and the, the effort they put into to her responses, trying to understand uh, what must be thousands or even millions of possible um, computations and, and sentences which could be said. Because, and I know Siri is the same. You always hear about Apple. Um, having to take millions of recordings of people talking to Siri to try and sculpt better how Siri can respond back to back to people. And I wonder if there is undertones there for uh, the future of, of architecture and the future of the design of buildings where technology will now allow us these feedback loops between people and architecture that perhaps there will be a design process which in some ways is actually more democratic and more 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 aligned with, uh, with 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 the with the immediate and the the real needs of people rather than the traditional architect behind a desk uh, visiting a site twice never talking to anyone at it and still designing something for it <laughs> that maybe there'd be a much deeper um, uh, conversation between designers and and citizens yeah potentially I, th I think a lot of things need to change in order for that um a uh, rather optimistic vision of the future to come to pass. But at the moment, all of these systems that we're talking about are all hidden behind um, corporate IP, patents, and proprietary algorithms. You know, like the, the, the systems of AI governance that currently manage a lot of our cities for us, um, you know, are not, uh, are not public at all. They're, they've been outsourced um, to, to a range of corporations that are not accountable to um, 
the citizens of that city or, or, a, or a public that democratically elects them, um, but they're accountable to shareholders. Um, and I think, you know, we need to start engaging with things like the idea of public code, you know, like, like if, if, if um, our cities are managed by, through these systems, why aren't we seeing the network? Why aren't we seeing um, uh, this code as a form of public infrastructure? You know, we're seeing this now more than ever. In the current moment here, we're talking across Zoom, um, a platform that has become the go-to for a planet in, in self-isolation. Um, Zoom's share price has skyrocketed on the back of, of this virus. Um, there's real questions about the privacy. There's the phenomena of, of Zoom bombing, where at any one moment, um, because probably the, the meeting ID for this chat is actually public, you know, someone might drop into this, to this interview um, uh, and, and live stream porn or an ad for their uh, website on, uh, in the middle of this conversation. Um, but it's also the, the essential service that's required in order for groceries to be delivered, in order for us to continue working and earning an income to pay our rent. Um, we see now more than ever that the internet is actually a public resource and infrastructure. Um, it's an essential service, just like uh, the fire department or the ambulance or water or power, um, yet it's bottlenecked and owned and um, subscription access um, uh, for just a handful of tiny, uh, a tiny handful of mega corporations. Um, you know, like, what if you can't afford your your um, uh, your internet account in this present moment? Um, it's catastrophic. Um, uh, you're you're a hermit. You're a shut-in. You you, you can't um, get essential services. You can't order your 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 toilet paper or your antibacterial wipes or your pasta. Um, uh, so, in order for this kind of um, democratization through technology that you're speaking of, we have to think about the, the forms of ownership around this technology in the first place. And, and I think we need to be having more conversations than what we are at the moment. At the moment, you know, we, we, we're scared of these systems entering our lives because the dominant discourse around these technologies, the dominant critical discourse around them is one of privacy. Um, but here you see like what, like, um, Actually, you know, there's there's really meaningful and productive forms of tracking that might help us get out of this current virus situation that we're in, um, if we're willing to open up um, our tracking data so that we can we can analyze um, uh, virus vectors. Um, you know, um, uh, obviously, a lot of um, uh, um, Libertarian groups are, are, are talking about the real catastrophe that, that, that can be caused from that. Um, but surely there's a way of doing that in a form that's productive and also regulated. Um, so, you know, I, I think we, we want to be having really critical conversations about how these things come into our lives without um, uh, being Luddites and um, uh, without resisting these forces arbitrarily, um, but equally without being totally um, naive about the way that they can be monetized and used against us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a really complex question. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not providing any, any solutions, um, uh, but um, I'm just, uh, I guess it's just a call to arms to say that we need to be thinking about these things mm -hmm. differently. Um, I mean, one of the projects that we're working on at the moment that um, we can see some images of as, as we scroll down um, that I'll send through is, a, is another piece that we did for Shenzhen Biennale um, called Choreographic Camouflage, um, where we worked with um, Jacob Jonas, who's um, uh, a famous choreographer, choreographer based here in LA. Um, Jacob did all the choreography for Kanye West's operas, for example. Um, and we started developing a project together uh, around the time um, that there were all the protests um, in Hong Kong. Um, and how the Chinese government were using um, facial recognition um, and also gait recognition, body detection software algorithms to, to map and to analyze protesters. Um, 
And now, you know, uh, through the course of this project, we see that everyone is now having to wear a face mask. So gate detection, which is using an algorithm to analyze the way we move and the way we walk, um, which is actually almost as individual to us as our, as our fingerprint, is now um, becoming a dominant form of um, uh, surveillance and identification within the city. Um, so so um, Jacob and I worked together to create a, a new movement vocabulary, a new choreography um, with his, with his um, dance group um, uh, that was based on fooling and tricking um, uh, body detection algorithms. Um, so, you know, these algorithms are, are kind of constantly analyzing images, looking for the traditional proportions of the body, two arms, two legs, a certain proportion of a torso to a shoulder, um, uh, a certain width of, uh, of, of, of um, a shoulder blade. Um, and if you can distort that silhouette of the body, if you can distort those proportions, um, then you can trick those algorithms. Um, so we've made a music video um, uh, working with his dancers and working with this vocabulary um, that, that shows this new pattern of movement um, that uh, makes the body disappear or, or makes two bodies appear as one body, for example, to, to talk about the ways that this um, surveillance system, the system of identification, which is now sitting at the core of so much governance um, and, and governance systems within, within cities is fundamentally flawed, really rudimentary, so easily tricked, um, full of its own biases and complexities um, that can be so easily revealed. Um, and I think it's projects like this that are important to start to raise um, this debate um, that we should be having about all of these systems within our cities. Mm -hmm. And they, that debate and the, the wider discussion, it, it always comes back to this um, theme of the, the collision of the virtual world and the physical world. And you had a very good quote from a conference you gave uh, late last year. I think you said it earlier as well. That you asked, uh, are we the customers or the citizens of the future cities that we design? And it's about this idea of, as designers, do we take a reactive approach to the technology we're seeing or a proactive approach to technology? And tied to that, you've often been an advocate, therefore, of architects exploring more how to design in virtual environments, right? The ability they can design for billions of people in virtual environments rather than having a relatively small impact in physical environments. And the question on that is how, where do you think that that journey can begin for architects? Do you think we need to rethink the way architects are trained uh, to engage them more with the virtual world or do you think this will just be part of the vocation of becoming a designer in the first place is an inherent interest in the virtual world as well as the physical world? In, in many ways, I think we're already training for that, for that world. Um, I think the, the skills of an architect are, are really easily transferable to, to a discipline like video game design. Um, but we're a, we're a discipline that, self censors in the most extraordinary um, and ridiculous ways. Um, we're constantly talking about what is or isn't architecture, um, what is or isn't an architect. No one else cares. <laughs> no, no, one, no one else is bothered um, besides us. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, another reason I'm here in LA is, is, is at SciArc, um, the architecture school here. Um, uh, I've started a new master's program called Fiction and Entertainment. And in that program, um, uh, you know, we, we take in um, people with undergraduate architecture degrees or masters in architecture or urban design, various in design disciplines, um, people from production design background, people from you know, UX design. Um, and we spend a year with them and help them to transition those skill sets into the entertainment industry. And in many ways, it's not about um, giving them a whole new set of tools, but it's just talking about how that industry works and what the points of access are, because really the skills are imminently transferable. You know, like if you think about it, the, the, the environments of a video game, um, constructing stories through space is actually what architects do. You know, I, if, if you think about it, like who, who's, who's the best person to really be designing these spaces? Is it someone that's done um, 
three years learning ZBrush and how to model a dragon and and the basics of level design um, at a at a you know um, entertainment design trade school, um, or is it someone that studied the history of space for five years, <laughs> getting a master's of architecture degree, um, looking at um, spatial sequencing and and um, the cultural implications of scale and all of these things, like you know, um, we're in a really extraordinary position to to, to actually be designing um, the level on the next um, uh, Half Life or Call of Duty or The Last of Us, um, uh, and you know, in, in doing so, we we open up our ideas to a massive audience of of people and gamers some of which may just rumble on through the worlds that we design, blowing stuff up, totally oblivious to the design of the space around us. Um, uh, but some of which might really engage with, with um, some of the ideas that we encode into those spaces. And, um, and I think that potentially could be really valuable. So, um, you know, I think that there's already scope um, for how we can do that. And I've tried to formalize that through this, through this master's program and helping people go, go into those spaces. And, and now we have graduates that are working in the video game industry, that are working in production design for film, that are working in virtual reality. Um, and I think that's um, been really productive so far. And I mean, I think, you know, games, VR, I think that's the tip of the iceberg. What we're gonna see happening as VR and AR start to collapse together, as, as those technologies start to evolve and real world object recognition and tracking starts to become a bit better, is that soon, you know, it's no longer gonna be enough to design just the physical fabric of a building, that um, a building isn't gonna be complete without its digital layer. Um, and I talk a lot about um, what I call green screen architecture, um, where I use the analogy of a green screen studio to talk about what architecture will soon become, where the surface of a building, the physical um, structure of that building is just a scaffold for a very complex digital world that might be different for each of us as we see the world through, whether it's you know, some form of Google Glass or um, uh, digital contact lens, whatever um, future you've subscribed to. Um, but, you know, each of us will soon be tuned to our own architectural channels where a space just like a green screen studio in any moment can be an alien landscape or the rainy streets of New York or, you know, a post-apocalyptic vision of a future city. Um, uh, like, uh, you know, I think that architects are going to have to start engaging with the design of the digital, not just as a game environment, but as a as a layer of space in the same way that we think about paint on a wall or um, uh, choosing fabric for curtains. We're also gonna have to think about designing this, this layer of pixels that gets draped over the world where every surface in some form becomes a screen. 